We have received hundreds of questions from viewers, and we've grouped them into different categories. I will ask them of the different speakers. I will remind the speakers to keep your answers as short as possible so we can cover as much ground as possible. A set of questions has to do with the care of a patient, and one aspect is just the spectrum of illness. And Armand, can you comment on the spectrum of illness and the established and known treatments that we have available? Well, the most obvious feature of Ebola is the gastrointestinal picture, that these patients come in with rather mild or nonspecific symptoms, and then they can start vomiting and producing large uh, amounts of diarrhea. And this outbreak has brought observations of, commonly from a number of physicians, of losses of over five liters a day. So crystalloid therapy, oral rehydration, when you get the opportunity to use it, are the hallmarks of our care. And I think even in the cases of evacuated expats in the North America and Europe, volume resuscitation has been the number one therapy above and beyond the experimental ones. Thank you. Uh, Jeremy, if you can comment on the novel or experimental therapies and how they fit in conceptually and what evidence we have, if any of them are effective at this time. Thank you very much. I'll be brief. I think they largely fall into three different categories. Firstly, starting off with antibody therapy of some description, small molecule antiviral drugs and immune modulatory drugs. Dealing with the, uh, and I should say, that as far as I'm aware at the moment, we have no good evidence that any of these treatment interventions are highly effective and we still lack data on safety. And that is crucial data to acquire in the short term, in my opinion. I would reiterate that I I do not believe that treatment on its own will turn this epidemic around, but it it may play a role in changing the dynamic, encouraging people to believe that this disease is actually treatable and we may uh, save lives, which is obviously critical. The antibody therapies fall into convalescent plasma. That's the antibodies from people that have survived, if they're willing to donate blood, and which has specific antibodies in, to monoclonal antibodies. And the most famous of those, of course, is the ZMAP antibody cocktail, which is being upscaled at the moment for future testing, and monoclonal antibodies that could potentially be generated from B cells of survivors or indeed also potentially from vaccinees, uh, healthy volunteers that have been vaccinated. Then you've got the specific antiviral drugs, perhaps the most advanced of these in terms of moving them through non-human primates into clinical testing is the small interfering RNA molecules, uh, and then the immune modulatory drugs, whether they be interferons or others. There are a, a number of other drugs which have been suggested and which I think the evidence is much less compelling for their assessment and some that I do not think should be used. And those would include, in my view, systemic corticosteroids, which should not be used. I think the evidence for ribavirin, for heparin, uh, for recombinant activated protein C and for statins, I think the evidence for that latter group is not sufficient to take it through to clinical testing in human beings at this time. We, we know that uh, patients that have survived do have specific antibodies in their blood and that the affinity of those antibodies increases over time. Of course, what we don't know is a threshold for which antibodies give you a surrogate marker of protection, although, of course, it's possible we may gather that in the coming month and over the course of this epidemic as we hopefully move towards vaccination and offering vaccine more widely. And I'm not aware, but others on the call may be, of data that absolutely confirms that somebody who was previously infected cannot be reinfected. Of course, there is evidence from non-human primates, but we should be cautious about extrapolating from non-human primates into human beings. There's no doubt that people who have survived do generate antibodies uh, which can neutralize in vitro and which can protect non-human primates. Armand, are you aware of data about immunity to a second infection? No. In humans, we've had the fortunate situation that nobody has had to endure two Ebola outbreaks in the same location. So we haven't had a chance to test that. And it's probably a good thing for the people involved, but it does limit our knowledge. This is Paul, and I can ask Armand, um, his colleagues in Monrovia have at least shared with us the story of a couple of children under five who had negative PCRs and then returned with some, uh, again, I'm not sure of the exact timeline, but some weeks later, I don't know, Armand, if you know about it, with positive PCR. Well, this is a different story. The, the time lapse between, well, so these are children who had a 
normal course of illness. They became ill, they went through the normal symptomatology and had a clinical recovery, and their PCR became negative. And they were, in one case, sent home, in another case, because the child was an orphan, kept next to the ETU. And then both of these children became ill. And it wasn't weeks, it was a, a day or two. They came back and were found to be febrile and positive again. Both of these children had some sort of neurologic signs, uh, as it's right. described to me. And the feeling amongst the virologists is that this is, they see this in animals where you have a, what they call a late progressor. The, the assumption is that the virus proceeds from the tissues where it normally starts out, the spleen, the liver, uh, the lymphoid tissues, and gets into sites in the body that have some immunologic protection, like the central nervous system. The immune response clears the virus from the periphery. The patient has a clinical recovery, becomes PCR negative, while the viral infection progresses in the CNS and then eventually returns and reemerges as a renewed positivity. Now, from what I understand, at least one of those children went on to recover and became negative again, so they were able to bounce back from that. I don't know the fate of the second child, but uh, this is supposition on our part. We don't have any, we weren't able to get a lumbar puncture on either of these children, to the best of my knowledge, but it would be consistent with what we've seen in the animal model. So, Armand, uh, along the lines of infectivity, you mentioned that when a patient recovers and their PCR, uh, their blood PCR, is above 36 cycles, they're no longer considered infectious and uh, are released. What is the strength of the evidence that with clinical recovery but still PCR positivity in some fluids, and, you know, semen can remain PCR positive for two to three months, that these individuals are no longer infectious. Well, so the, the evidence is very, very weak. We've known about the semen for, well, for years since Kikwit and probably before that. And when we do discharge male patients who recover, they are sent home with uh, very strong advice to uh, make sure that they do not spread the disease through their semen. The rest is, again, it's epidemiologic. These patients go home and do not produce further cases in their domestic environment. So they are not infectious to the best of our knowledge. And the rest is by extrapolation from animal studies where the virologists have not been able to recover virus past that point. And so the assumption is that the PCR signal is from antibody-bound virus. So nucleic acid is present but not culturable or there isn't evidence of viral viability. That's correct. We have a cluster of questions around transmission and transmission risk. And I'd like to ask Arjun to comment on, you know, what does it take to become infected? Is this an aerosolized, not through medical procedure, but just sort of like influenza? Can this be spread by aerosol? What kind of contact is required and is intact skin a vulnerability? Thank you. That's a good question. Again, I, I would refer people, I think, uh, the issue of Ebola transmission, I think, is laid out very nicely in the Ebola transmission document that's on the CDC website, which really goes through the papers. The, the current thinking, and Armand might want to comment also on this, the best evidence that we have suggests that the overwhelming route of transmission is through contact with contaminated fluids with broken skin or mucous membranes. The issue, of course, is that there can be splashes that are involved, given, as you've heard, the, the significant amount of diarrhea and severe vomiting that patients can have. But the issue of aerosol transmission is, to my understanding, not thought to be an important route of transmission, that the route that we need to protect against, most importantly, is contact with this infectious material, although the use of the respiratory equipment would, of course, um, prevent that transmission in the healthcare setting. Arjun, outside of the healthcare setting, as we go into flu season and I go on the bus or the subway and I am being coughed and sneezed on, how you risky know, is that? Yeah, you know, I, I might defer to Armand on that. Uh, obviously, there's a lot more experience uh, with that question in, in West African settings. Uh, Armand, do you have thoughts on that particular question? If there were significant airborne transmission, we would see spontaneously generated cases that were not linked to a known case. There would be cases of casual transmission. And as you noted, when we find our cases and we examine their exposure history, it inevitably tracks back to a significant exposure where you've had hands-on care of the sick, attendance at a funeral, 
or some similar contact with fomites or patients that allows us to explain it through direct transmission. We've never had to invoke aerosol as a hypothesis to explain things that were not otherwise explicable. So if it, were, if it does occur, it is clearly not a significant form of transmission. The Public Health Agency of Canada just published a study showing that in non-human primates, there was a failure to transmit between caged monkeys at a rather close distance. So we're taking that as a hopeful sign because this is the same lab that showed us that in pigs, this can be an airborne disease. And in the current discussion, infectivity is thought to occur after symptom onset. How well yes. is this established? I think it's mostly an article of faith. Again, we don't see transmission between people who have had casual contact. The feeling is that even within the first day of disease, when you simply have a fever and no production of infectious body fluids, you don't see a disease transmission through that sort of casual contact. So we assume that it is not transmissible or not easily transmissible during the incubation period or through the even into the very first uh, day or two of the disease. But this remains to be shown, and we'd like to actually have this studied. Uh, and along those lines, and this is a question for Matthew, envi- in the community, environmental contamination, how concerned should we be? At this point, very not concerned, or you should be worried about this at all, the way we are going. We have a handful of patients, all but a few are still in the hospital. And when you look at environmental contamination in the community, only three patients were actually out in the community. And when we look at Dallas, the situation, that that individual who was back in his home, the other people who were in that home during his illness where he actually had nausea and vomiting and diarrhea and everything have already passed their incubation period. So he did not transmit to those other individuals. And it sounds like survival of the virus on inert surfaces is not prolonged Well, at uh, usual uh, temperatures? What we think, now there's very limited data about this, is that in the natural environment, it doesn't persist for long periods of time. In laboratory studies, which you can easily manipulate your conditions and everything is well controlled, yes, virus might be able to persist for longer periods of time, but we don't have other data to say. This is Arjun. If I could also say, I think everybody on the call probably obviously knows this, but one thing that I think is relevant information for us to have and to consider is that the family members of the initial patient are now beyond that 21-day incubation period. So none of the family members who were living in space with the initial patient who had Ebola in this country, of course, with living in the community without any protective equipment, it appears that none of them were infected with Ebola. And I, and I think that a particularly important thing for us to all remember when we think about the the infectivity, and we we don't base a lot on one small experience, but I think it is a helpful experience to remember. On a a different tact, and this is a question for for Chris, Um, the R0 for this outbreak uh, appears to be in the one and a half to two range. Um, which is substantially lower than uh, for measles or influenza. How do you think about this in terms of the transmissibility and outbreak control? I think the first thing to say about the reproduction number is that what is being measured and what is being regularly published are averages for whole communities. What I would have said uh, if I had a little bit longer in my talk is a little bit more about the outbreak that we saw in uh, DRC in Congo, where the index case was probably responsible for infecting 21 other people. And that is uh, formally an R0 for that outbreak of 21, which, of course, is enormously high. But I think this is characteristic of Ebola. We see certain events, notably burials, but other events as well, where a lot of infections are transmitted during the course of that event. Our estimates are that perhaps a quarter of all infections come from funerals or unsafe burials. So that's the context in which we should view these numbers of about one and a half or two. But at the community level, even an R naught of around about one and a half or two means, as we've seen, a doubling time, given the serial interval, given the, given the generation time, a doubling time of three to four weeks or so. And if that persists, then, of course, we can see a, a huge increase in cases into the thousands or, or even tens of thousands. And that's what's happened across the three countries from June, July, going into August and September.
And it seems that consistent with what's been already discussed, that transmissibility is a much more direct contact, which is why if direct contact behaviors are diminished, then control is more attainable as opposed to measles. Absolutely. As the other speakers have said on this call, the route of transmission is rather well understood. There is speculation about other forms of transmission arising as the virus mutates and so on, but there's very little evidence for any of that happening at the moment. So fundamentally, we know how to stop infections being transmitted in a community. And one other feature of this average value of R0, let's say it's in the vicinity of, of two, is that it means that if you can cut out a little more than half of transmission, then the infection is destined to inevitably die away from the community. So if we had a vaccine, for example, with 50% efficacy that could be given to everybody or efficacy a little bit higher than that, we would expect it to have a substantial impact at community level. But of course, the variation that I pointed out earlier on means that even if infection is declining on average in the population, we have to be very wary of outbreaks surrounding certain events. I mentioned Kenema district earlier on where we have seen uh, in eastern Sierra Leone an increase in cases recently and the evidence from our colleagues on the ground is that this increase is associated with one or two instances of unsafe burial. So we should be able to force case numbers down but make a few mistakes and they'll come back up again. Sure. Uh, Another issue which several listeners have commented on, and this is for Paul, is the epicenters in West Africa. Why not stop air travel until the outbreak is over? Quarantine could be very effective. Paul, do you think this would work? Well, I I don't, and there are other people who are epidemiologists on the the line, but I don't think there's evidence that it would work or that it has worked in the past. And just to add one thing about the region that this particular zoonosis has emerged from is, you know, there, there is not a clear boundary. It's in the middle of forest. And again, that's on the Côte d'Ivoire side. This is also an issue. And uh, it certainly would have, however, an adverse effect on our ability to stop the epidemic because it would hamper the movement of the staff and stuff we need so much. And so I can see an adverse effect, but I can't see how it would help slow down the epidemic. The CDC would surely have more to say. Uh, Yes, Chris speaking. Uh, What Paul has just said is completely in line with what WHO is recommending. We don't want to see air travel curtailed. There isn't a strong reason for thinking that that is going to be effective. And as been pointed out, may have many detrimental effects. Including including one, Lindsay, that Jim Kim would not forgive me for not mentioning, which is continued economic and social degradation, shortages of food and fuel, etc. C- collapse within the region and um, uh, further infrastructure destabilization. Armand, one last question. The testing for Ebola early on may be negative initially. Do you commonly see that? And how often do you need to do testing before you're convinced someone does not have Ebola? Obviously, someone who presents at risk with a compatible syndrome-like fever. Negative result does not reliably exclude Ebola until 72 hours after the onset of symptoms. We will occasionally see positive results earlier than that, depending on how fast the illness is progressing. So we do test people when they come in, even if they come in in the first three days. But if they are negative, we hold on to them until at least 72 hours into the course of their illness. Thank you. I would like to thank all the speakers uh, for participating and sharing their thoughts. And as we all have heard, there are more questions than answers. And we'll continue to learn as we gain more knowledge regarding this outbreak and improve our response.